Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Doomer Optimism podcast. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, Richard Heinberg. Uh, Richard has been uh, quite influential for both Josh and I, uh, his writings. For me, it's been, you know, your analysis of energy and energy transition and what it would take um, for us to transition. Josh, do you want to talk about, just mention briefly um, his influence on, on your thinking? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, uh, I appreciate a lot of things about your writing, Richard, but I especially appreciate how you really will directly confront certain shibboleths like around growth and that sort of thing. And I think may, maybe the first book of yours that I read was The End of Growth or something like that. It might have been the first one. But um, my background is in environmental chemistry and engineering. I work a lot on, on uh, low tech water treatment methods and that sort of thing. But I have overlapping interests in sustainability science in general. I spent a couple of years as a research fellow at Global Footprint Network working on ecological footprint analysis. I have a sort of ad hoc um, education in ecological economics, and I'm, I'm really drawn to the very direct, very clear way that you spell out a lot of these issues and um, paint in very clear relief the tough decisions that we have to make going forward. Um, with an appreciation for what technology can do for us, but a calibrated appreciation so that our expectations of what we can get through technology and efficiency are tempered by, you know, just biophysical laws of the biosphere and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. and I, th I think my introduction to your work, so my interest is in food systems broadly. My background was in economics. I, I think I'm kind of a um, reformed economist, I've drifted much more towards the ecological you know, e economic side. And I think actually my, my first introduction to your work was the report by uh, Jason Bradford in um, The Future is Rural. And he basically, he drew from your, from your Our Renewable Future book about, uh, in particular, like six reasons that it's not just a matter of if we're going to transition to renewable energy, it's not just a matter of unplugging fossil fuels and plugging in renewables. Um, there's, there's some major challenges. And he, 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 of course, applies that to the food system. And I found that very interesting. But I think for our, our case, I think it might be really interesting to, to start there, uh, to start, I guess, with the question of why, you know, well, one, why do we want to move away from fossil fuels? Um, maybe from both a climate perspective, but also a resource availability perspective. Uh, but also, why, why can't we just do it? Why can't we just put solar panels everywhere and, and continue our current lifestyles? Whoa, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll, 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 we'll spend plenty of time to unpack, so don't feel yeah, like- Yeah, let's, let's, let's break it down a little bit. Yeah. Um, First, why should we get off fossil fuels? Well, of course, you know everybody's talking about climate change, so I'm not going to rehearse just how awful uh, the future the future looks if we keep, you know, emitting carbon into the atmosphere. And uh, you know, I, most serious people are are agreed that that's you know catastrophe to the nth power. Mm -hmm. Okay, but. Um, is there any other reason to get off fossil fuels? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are depleting non-renewable resources and we've been extracting them at ever increasing rates for uh, decades now. Coal since at the, the early 19th century, oil, especially since 1950. I mean, um, there, I love to meditate on the chart of world oil, or excuse me, world energy usage. And if you look at that chart, you know, uh, starting around 1800, you know, coal comes on and then starts to really grow in, in the 20th century. But then around 1950, oil, which we had started actually using in the mid 19th century at a small scale, oil just takes off. And that graph just shoots upward. Um, uh, historian, uh, 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 J.R. McNeil calls this the great acceleration because the you know if you look at, at the graph of, of of world GDP the same thing happens I mean from uh, 1950 to the mid 1970s this was the period of the most rapid economic growth in all of human history There's nothing like it um, 
So what's wrong with this picture? You know, we're extracting more and more of these fuels from the earth and burning them once and for all. You know, you can't recycle oil once you've burned it. Um, and doing all these wonderful things with it, in, in effect, becoming more and more dependent on the services that these fuels provide. So we're building massive infrastructure, highways and vehicles and and production processes and, and home heating systems and, you know, everything, all of the, the technology and infrastructure of modern industrial life built around the specific characteristics of these fuels. And now there's, they are actually starting to get scarce. I mean, it's not as though, uh, you know, we're going to run out of oil, natural gas or coal next year or 10 years from now. There's still a lot of stuff left, but we've extracted them using the low hanging fruit principle. So as time goes on, the next increment of coal, the next increment of oil or natural gas is going to be more costly, more difficult to extract. It'll take more energy to extract it. So the energy return on the energy that we invest in producing energy is declining and also more polluting because the, you know, the stuff that we're extracting now, like Canadian tar sands and, and China is digging deeper for, for coal and, uh, and so on. It's, it's just nastier, dirtier stuff. So there's all, all sorts of good reasons to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, environmental reasons and simple pragmatic reasons. What are children and grandchildren going to do if they can't use these fuels? Presumably they're you know, they'll, they'll have to have some other source of energy. So that gets us to the question, the, the second part of the question you brought up, which was, well, can't we just switch to wind and solar power and keep living the way we are now? So let me take a breath. <laughs> Back to the second part, let me just bring up, so some people argue, I don't, I don't buy this argument, but some people argue that it's getting harder to extract the remaining reserves, but our technology is getting better. And so some people right. have faith that the technology improvements will, will compensate for them being harder to get. Um, do you wanna just comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, see, technology is what we use to use energy. <laughs> right. So the, the, the yeah. technology that we use in, uh, in increasing our rate or efficiency of, let's say of oil production, that uses energy too. Yeah. So it's, it's reducing, even though, yeah, we can get more oil out of a particular place. It's like uh, fracking, right? Uh, you know, the US has seen a, an absolute miracle in the last 10 years with uh, production of tight oil from horizontal drilling and hydrofracturing. U.S. oil production went up from, I don't know, something like 5 million bar barrels a day to more like 13 million barrels a day. A rate of increase in oil production that no nation has ever seen in the whole history of the oil industry. So when I say it's a miracle, yeah, it's, it's really something as a result of the application of this new technology. Hmm. But why was the technology even necessary? Because regular conventional oil production in the US had been declining since 1970s and has hit a plateau globally. So if we're gonna have increasing increments of oil, in other words, if we're gonna increase the rate of oil production, we've gotta get it from some other, other way. And so geologists knew about these deposits in the US in the Permian Basin in the Bakken uh, region of uh, North Dakota, they knew about this oil, but nobody was interested in it because it was in rock that was so, uh, has had such low permeability that, you know, you could, you could sink a vertical oil well into this, this rock and the oil would basically just stay there. It wouldn't, it wouldn't move toward the, the well bore, uh, so how do you how do you solve that with technology like horizontal? You drill uh, down a ways and then you go horizontal into the into the rock seam where the where the oil is. So you have much more contact uh, between the the oil resource and the well bore. You punch holes with explosives. Uh, you pump water down to uh, to 
encourage the oil to go toward the, the well bore. All of that takes energy, right? And so, yeah, uh, new technology can help, but if the purpose of the whole exercise is to produce energy and the technology is absorbing more and more energy, well, it's, you know, when we were relying on regular conventional oil, the energy return on energy invested was in the range of 50 to one. Invest one unit of energy, get 50 units of energy back. The oil industry is down to more like 15 to one, and, and in some cases down to like six or seven or eight to one. Uh, okay, it's still worth doing it, but we have organized our society on the basis of the expectation that we're going to have a very high energy return on energy investment. Otherwise, all of our capital, all of our labor is just going to have to go back into uh, energy producing activities, and we're going to have less and less available for doing all the things we want to do with energy. Right. I want to, can I uh, maybe drill down on some of the points that you made there, Richard? I remember, you know, several years ago, you and David Hughes and other people from Post Carbon Institute had done some really incisive reporting when um, the sort of fracking shale boom thing was really ramping up. Right. And all these projections were made about how much oil we can recover from here and there. And then, you know, you all coming along and doing these careful analyses and saying, well, realistically, what we can expect versus what's being projected. And also, I think making the point that a lot of that has been enabled somewhat by technology applied to, to fracking, but a lot of it just that companies were able to borrow huge amounts of money at effectively zero interest rates. Right. And it was creating this, this churn. And, uh, you know, and I, I followed your work and Art Berman and some of these other people talking about this critically. And uh, I, I was wondering if you could kind of, you know, touch back on some of that stuff and, and then kind of bring us up to today where we stand, because quite frankly, I'm surprised the whole thing has made it this long. You know, I thought I thought at the time this is a, a bubble. It's going to burst in a couple of years and there's going to be massive disappointment and it's not going to deliver what's expected. But, yeah. but it's it's been, I guess, more resilient than I would have expected. Can you kind of like uh, help us work out this puzzle a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, it, it has been a bubble. And in fact, the website that we maintain with all of the analysis you were talking about is called shalebubble.org. And there's a lot of really useful uh, data and analysis there for, for those who are interested in this subject. So yeah, you're right. Um, it, this was enabled as not just by technology, but also really low interest rates after the 2008 financial crash. So these companies, and we're not talking about big oil companies like Shell and, and uh, uh, Exxon and, and so on. It's mostly small to medium-sized oil companies that were willing to take on a lot of debt and a lot of risk. And in many cases, they were losing money hand over fist uh, because they had to invest so much in technology for such a high rate of drilling. These individual wells would deplete so rapidly, uh, production would decline so rapidly in each individual well that you just had to drill and drill and drill uh, and invest, invest, invest in order to uh, produce significant amounts of, of uh, product. So now that oil prices are much higher, these companies are making money. They held on long enough. So the industry is doing okay right now. But the other problem they've encountered is that there are only small sweet spots where drilling is really effective and, and profitable in any of these plays. I mentioned the Permian Basin in Texas, Bakken in North Dakota, there are several others. So there are only a few of these plays and, e and within each of the plays, there's only a small sweet spot where it, it's worthwhile to drill. Those sweet spots are getting filled with holes in the ground. So if you drill more holes, they start to interfere with each other. So each well produces less and less. That's already happened in the back end. So North Dakota, which was this you know, miraculous, uh, place of, you know, who, who expected North Dakota to be a global center of oil production, in, you know, prior to say 2008, but that's what it became in the years, you know, 2010, 2012, so on. Now it's in decline already after a decade, the back end's in decline, permanent decline. 
uh, the Permian is basically the only basin left in the US where oil production still can grow probably for the next two, three, four years, but it has to overcome the, the increasing decline rates from the other uh, plays that are now seeing their productions falling off. So that's kind of where we are right now. The, the industry is more profitable as a result of very high oil prices, but of course that's at the expense of everybody going, hey, we, we don't want to pay $5 a gallon for gasoline. You know, what's, this, is a, this is a huge problem. We got to change the, you know, re elect a different president or do something because we, this is completely unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> So if, if, if the motorists get what they want, then the industry is, again, unprofitable. So there's no longer a, a Goldilocks oil price. There, you know, in, historically, the oil industry operated with oil prices that, that had this Goldilocks mean where it was cheap enough to encourage motorists and, and increasing use of, of fossil fuels throughout society. But was, it was just expensive enough so that the industry could make really good profits and make huge fortunes for you know, the people who, who were managers of, of the oil industry. But that, that Goldilocks price just doesn't exist anymore. Either oil is too expensive for motorists or it's not expensive enough for drillers. Mm -hmm. And of course, the United States, as you mentioned before, our infrastructure was built around the automobile. And so it's not like a lot of people who have to say drive to their minimum wage job have many alternatives and yeah. so it's it's relatable that yeah like if you know a large chunk of your paycheck is being used to put fuel in your vehicle and there's no say alternatives available that can be a real, can be a real issue <clears throat> well why don't we uh why don't we switch over now to um why we can't just unplug uh, fossil fuels, plug in, you know, our electric cars and electric key pumps and, you know, uh, basically plug, plug society into renewables and off we go. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that I am not absolutely opposed to all renewable energy. Mm -hmm. I, there are some people who are. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to think that uh, it's really important that we maintain our electricity grids as long as we can. Because society has come to rely on electricity for all of our important life-sustaining processes. I mean, even the, the gasoline pumps run on electricity, right? So if the grid goes down, we lose so much cultural information, uh, technical information, how things work, um, financial information, uh, you know, basically civilization crashes and billions of people die in short order if the grid goes down. So I'm all for keeping the grid going as long as we can. Renewable energy sources produce electricity. That's what the grid is all about. Mm. So if we can make enough solar panels and wind turbines to do that, great. I have solar panels on my roof. I've had them for over 20 years. There's a technician on my roof right now as I'm speaking who's taking off our antique solar panels and replacing them with new ones. Mm -hmm. so, so, and I drive an electric car. So what I, what I have to say is not, it doesn't come from some doctrinaire stance of being anti-renewables. But that said, at the biggest problem with uh, renewable energy replacing fossil fuels is the problem of scale. The scale of energy usage that we've developed as a result of having access to cheap fossil fuels is absolutely gargantuan by historical standards. Uh, fossil fuels were these amazing substances produced by nature over tens of millions of years. We're talking about tens of millions of years of ancient sunlight that was gathered by ancient plants and concentrated through process, geological processes in which we had to invest zero effort ourselves. And so we get these fuels that are, that are energy dense, uh, portable, storable, perfect energy sources compared to what we were using previously. And they solved all these problems for us. Uh, producing more food, making it cheaper and easier to, uh, to transport stuff, make stuff, extract raw materials, transform them into consumer products. 
and basically that's the whole modern world, okay? So can renewable energy do that? In principle, it can. On, on, uh, at, at a laboratory scale, there are zero problems with the energy transition. Any problem you, you can imagine having to do with energy storage or how you, you know, turn solar electricity into uh, some good or service that you want, it can be solved at the laboratory scale. The problem is the, the scale of energy usage that we've, that we've developed because solar panels, wind turbines are gonna take up a lot of space and they're gonna require an enormous amount of minerals. So instead of, of drilling for oil and natural gas and mining coal, we're going to be mining minerals and metals with which to make solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, uh, right. electric cars, and all this other stuff. And so the mining challenge is actually enormous. And just in the last couple of years, the, the IMF, the World Bank, the uh, International Energy Agency, uh, McKinsey and Company consultants, all of them have produced these in-depth papers on the materials challenge to the renewable energy transition. Mm -hmm. And if you read those papers, none of them wants to come out and say, hey, this is gonna be impossible. They, all, as far as they're willing to go, of course, is just say, hey, you know, this is gonna be really difficult and it's gonna create geopolitical challenges because instead of fighting over oil wells, we're gonna be fighting over lithium mines. Right, um, I, I, I and so on. Uh, Go ahead. By uh, I think it's pronounced Simon Michaud. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably familiar with his work. Yes, he recently came out with a report trying to do okay. If we were to theoretically, uh, outside of the laboratory, theoretically replace you know fossil fuels with alternative energy sources, including nuclear, uh, including you know hypothesize say biofuels for aviation and hydrogen fuel, fuel cells for heavy industrial processes, maybe uh, in, in just, you know, according to, you know, what would be theoretically feasible, uh, looking at the resource requirements, the metals, basically, there, there was a lot of big shortfalls. Um, yeah. This includes, this includes lithium, uh, this includes, here, I, I'm just going to bring it up in my mind. Uh, real quick, it includes uh, like cobalt and uh, and many others, some copper. of which copper. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it seems almost laughable looking at these charts that he produced that we would be able to, um, to, 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 to do that just from a metals perspective. Yeah, Simon works for uh, Finland's um, geological survey so he's a, he's a really good person to do this kind of assessment and you know he's one of the few who like come right out and say what the data really imply which is that you know we can't do this at scale now there are some others who who look at those numbers and they say well yeah but maybe we could at least do the first iteration you know we could build out you know, enough solar panels and wind turbines to do this one time. And then as they age and, and require replacement, we could just recycle all the stuff that we built the first time. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a, a researcher in France who, who crunched the numbers and, and said, well, of course, the, the problem with that is that materials degrade and uh, recycling takes energy. So, yeah. It's not a long-term solution, but he crunched the numbers and said, well, how long could that keep industrial society running? And um, he, he thought optimistically, maybe 300 years. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's like the best possible scenario for the energy transition. You know, we, we, we build this stuff, then we recycle it and recycle it. And over the course of the next 300 years, it gradually kind of goes away. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, so his his report, I think this graph I'm looking at, it's for just for one generation of technology to phase out fossil fuels. Um, that, that, that was what he based his report on. Right. And yeah, like copper, for example, according to his calculations, reserves cover like 20% of requirements. Um, right. lithium, lithium, 10%, you know, and I can go on and on. But um, 
I guess that, uh, you know, a lot also depends on alternative materials, right? It, it assumes that we have to use lithium, you know, lithium ion batteries, for example, as opposed to something right. else. Yeah, yeah there, there are substitutions that are possible. You know, we could use batteries with iron rather than lithium. There are people who are working on that. And there's a lot more iron in the Earth's crust than there is lithium. So, you know, there, there, are, some, there are some possibilities. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you do come up against hard limits. Yeah. And, and the reality is we're, we're not even coming close to getting there anyway. I mean, currently, the world is spending about... Um, $500 billion total on the energy transition annually. That's a lot of money, but the International Energy Agency says it's about a tenth as much as we actually need to be spending, more like $5 trillion a year. Mm -hmm. So, and, and how that 500 billion, what, is that, what does that mean? It, if you look at individual countries like China, the US and the EU, these are all countries that are scraping as hard as they can to invest that much. Like the U.S., we just got this, um, you know, what is it, $300 billion uh, infrastructure. Well, it's, it's called the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, okay? And it's meant to sort of jumpstart the energy transition. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm all in favor of it. I'm not, I'm not criticizing it as being a bad idea. But is it enough to transition the U.S.? Um, absolutely not. Again, it's, it's probably on the order of 10% of what would need to be spent. And are, is, is the U.S. political system capable of doing this on an annual basis? In other words, next year, are we going to ha have another $300 billion devoted to this? Oh, it's, that's, that would be really, really tough. It'll be years before there's, there's enough you know, political momentum in the U.S. to support another effort like that. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds, what you're saying essentially is that, you know, there's where we need to get in terms of the transition. And then there's yeah. the level of effort and funding and everything and intention that's like so far falling short of what would be needed to make the transition in time. So can you talk a little bit about what, like why that gap is there? Is this, is this like a matter of like, well, uh, certain things about our lifestyle are just non-negotiable. I should be able to get on an airplane and fly wherever I want in the world, provided I have money for a ticket. I mean, what is it that is really holding us back from making these changes, not only allocating the funding, but actually we're going to have to train our workforce to engage in completely different activities that are supported by, you know, the energy infrastructure of the future rather than, you know, we're cranking out university graduates now to go and essentially operate the energy infrastructure of the past, right? So what, what, what does it take to actually start making these changes? Yeah, that's, that's very well said. Um, well, the biggest obstacle in my view is our addiction to economic growth. Because uh, right now the assumption is that we have to keep things going at the same scale and speed they currently are, global transportation, uh, resource extraction, uh, you know. Um, we essentially have to double our economy every 30 years. If yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so not only do we have to keep everything going as it is now, we also have to plan for doubling it 30 years from now. And that's insanely difficult. You know, it was easy back in the 1950s through the 1970s as I was describing earlier, the, the period of the most rapid economic growth in history. And we made the, the, the deadly mistake of thinking that that was because we were just getting so smart. You know, it wasn't because we had this one time only burst of support from fossil fuels that enabled us to do these things. It, we, we assumed it was because we were so smart and because we'd invented, you know, features of capitalism, uh, support for investment and, and so on. And therefore we'd be able to do it forever. But in, in reality, from a biophysical perspective, that's just absurd. And we we're at the, at the end of that pulse of growth now and tip, tipping into global ec economic contraction during the remainder of this century, exactly when that tipping point will be, you know, 
I don't, nobody knows for sure. Maybe it's, we've already just passed it. Maybe it'll be 10 years from now, but it's not going to be 50 years from now. Um, the world will tip into sort of permanent recession and economic contraction. And the, the real game at that point will be, how do we manage this without, you know, falling into real catastrophic collapse? Yeah. How do we how do we prevent casualties and maintain the goods that we've developed of uh, industrial civilization, the knowledge, the uh, practical information? Yeah, and that's that's it. That's the game from here on. I want to I want to get uh, much deeper into the political economy and, and cultural implications, but I want to back up just a little bit first and talk a little bit more about electricity, um, one, of, one of the challenges that you mentioned uh, is the liquid fuels problem. And you know, our economy right now, I believe in the United States, we, our energy economy is about 40% at most of our energy economy. Um, electricity you know, is about 20% of our, of our total energy, final energy usage. Okay, so, that, okay. so, I other... looking, yeah, so I was looking at a very optimistic graph. Yeah, um, yeah, about, <laughs> yeah. okay, so 20%, that, yeah, that's, um, that's sobering. Um, what is it about, you know, and I think this would just be useful for us and for the audience, just energy literacy. You know, oftentimes people think of kind of operational energy of like you plug something in, you get electricity, but uh, do you want to talk about, you know, some kind of crucial aspects of our economy that are very hard to electrify at scale? Sure. Um, well, first of all, electricity is a wonderful energy carrier. It's extremely mm -hmm. versatile. That's why we have plugs all over our houses and offices where you can plug in any kind of device that, ha that has a plug to it and it, and it works. It's, it's terrific. Mm -hmm. But electricity is expensive to produce. Uh, with fossil fuels, it's very inefficient and a very high percentage of energy gets wasted in the process of generating electricity. The good thing about renewables, in, including geothermal, and also including, uh, well, not so much including nu nuclear, because a lot of energy is actually wasted in nuclear reactor too, in, in the form of heat. But well, anyway, at least with, <laughs> with solar and wind, uh, you produce electricity directly. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's cool. Yeah. But as you say, there are a lot of things that are going to be difficult to electrify. Uh, electric cars work great. I've been driving one for years now, and uh, I, I just, you know, we have, the next car we buy will be an electric car. Uh, I'm never going back to to uh, gasoline powered car after the experience of driving electric. But what about 18 wheel trucks that deliver all the stuff to Walmart or to Amazon warehouses? Those are going to be much harder to electrify because the energy density of batteries mm. is so much less than the energy density of fuels. And that's also a big problem for uh, aviation. Mm. Now, there are some small electric airliners with just a few passengers that are on the drawing boards now that will fly short distances. But flying 300 people from you know, Singapore to New York uh, on electricity, it's not going to happen. Uh, then there are lots of industrial processes like making uh, cement for concrete. Now, concrete is really the bedrock basis of modern industrial society. If you're going to build anything in terms of infrastructure, the first thing you think about is concrete. Uh, but making cement happens in kilns that operate at 1500 degrees Celsius, 24 seven, 365 days a year. Electrifying those things is theoretically possible, but it would be super expensive. So what's, what's the answer with all of these things? What, how do we run aviation, cement kilns, all these other things? The mining for the copper and <laughs> that you need. Yeah, right. Well, you uh, can do it. Here's yeah. where I, I get back to what I was saying earlier. You can solve the, all of these problems at, at the laboratory scale. You do it by using electricity to make hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hydrogen has some problems. It likes to leak. 
uh, at, from pipelines, from tanks, anything you put hydrogen in, it, it's going to leak from uh, a, a regular, if we, if we had regular cars with hydrogen tanks, they'd leak more than 5% of the hydrogen every day. Yeah. So how practical is that? So what you do, again, solution, you take the hydrogen, you combine it with carbon that you've taken out of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and you make a synthetic fuel, like say methanol. This can be done at the laboratory scale. But what are the drawbacks? Well, first there's the inefficiency of making hydrogen. Yeah. So it, take, it costs energy to do that. Then there's the efficiency of combining the hydrogen with the methanol. Then we get back to the problem of scale. If you were going to provide enough of this synthetic fuel to cover the aircraft industry, 18 wheel trucks, uh, high heat industrial processes, and so on, you would need a really big synthetic fuel industry. It would, in fact, rival the size of today's oil and gas industry. So you'd need all of that new infrastructure of uh, you know, factories and pipelines and, and so on to replace what we currently have. And that is a big, that's a big ticket, both from a standpoint of financial investment and energy investment. Um, and and lower, lower net energy as well, yeah. right? We, yeah. We, that would inevitably lead to that, the, just the inefficiency of, of this process you're describing from an energy, net energy perspective. Yeah, it's often pointed out correctly that moving to solar and wind will make our overall energy system more efficient because these, these devices produce electricity directly rather than you know, burning fossil fuels very infant, uh, inefficiently to turn turbines to make the electricity. That's true. Mm -hmm. But then you have to have batteries to store the power. You have to have uh, synthetic fuels to use it for, for all of these other purposes we've been talking about. And those introduce new inefficiencies into the system. So what's the, what's the balance at the end of the day? Would, it, we, would we have a global energy system that's more efficient or less efficient than our current one? Well, it would be, who knows? <laughs> those, nobody's done all of those calculations yet. But the fact is we'd, we'd be starting out with energy sources that are by their very nature less productive from an energy return on energy investment yeah. perspective than oil and gas and coal were during the course of the 20th century as we were building all of this stuff in the first place. So you know, once again, we come, come to the, back to the realization that you know, these, these technologies can do good things for us, but we are foolish to expect that they'll do the same things for us that fossil fuels did. Yeah, what, so, one more, one uh, more thing about energy, just real quick. Um, people, when you talk about these issues, you inevitably get the nuclear maximalists. Um, mm -hmm. that we just need to build a bunch more nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear fusion, if that ever comes online and we're getting closer and closer, we promise, you know, it, uh, that will be a game changer. Uh, do you want to just talk both about, you know, potential of next generation nuclear fission and nuclear nuclear fusion? If, if that if that is a wild card or if you just think that it's a pipe dream or 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 maybe, you know, maybe we think of it as like providing kind of a base load and we, we increase a little bit or how do you think about nuclear? Um, well, the way I think about nuclear is, is mostly pretty negatively, frankly, because you know the promises made for nuclear were were spectacular. You know, power too cheap to meter, safe, you know, etc. And it turned out to be any but anything but those things. It turned out to be very expensive. It turned out to be risky. And there's no solution for the radioactive waste. So it's just piling up all over the planet, creating huge problems for the next generation and generations after going out thousands of, literally thousands of years. So that, so how about the next generation of nuclear power? Isn't that gonna solve those problems? Well, remember those claims are coming from exactly the same people who were telling us that it would be too cheap to meter and so on back in the fifties and sixties and seventies. And that I've seen some, some pretty good analyses of the kind of next generation, ge next generation modular reactors and so on for which all these claims are being made. And you know, pulling, pulling apart those claims critically, 
it, you know, you see that in fact, the waste problem gets worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and these are going to be very expensive. It's the problems aren't solved at all. And well, what about fusion? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, every time I see the headlines, it's like, you know, amazing advance in, in fusion power. We're getting that much closer to energy break even. And that's like the holy grail where we get to the point where the amount of energy that we put into the fusion process mm -hmm. is, is equaled by the energy that we get out. Well, duh, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to do anything for us. We got to get way beyond energy break even in order for fusion to be of, of any benefit. And we're the, the engineers are still very, very far from accomplishing that. In fact, I think I, if I can tag on there too, when you're discussing the question about, okay, so some advocates come at this and say, well, we need to rapidly just, you know, we got to get over our resistance to nuclear. We just got to start putting up some more nuclear power plants and stuff. And I, I don't have the number on the tip of my brain. I used to teach this in, to university students, but again, it comes back to the question of scale, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's talk about, we're going to electrify as much as we possibly can of everything. Right. And then we're going to, you know, uh, build out our grid to be able to supply that. So how many nuclear plants are we talking about? And the number, it comes out to something like from right now until the year 2040, we have to build like one large new nuclear power plant uh, every day and a half or something like that. I don't, <laughs> it's not the exact number, but it's like, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of nuclear power plants all over the world yeah. built in a very short amount of time. And so even if, even if somebody's more persuaded about the possible benefits of nuclear power, I'm just like, look around. Are you watching nuclear power plants go up all around you? Because that's yeah. what it would take. I mean, if you just do the calculation, I don't know if you have maybe a more up to date on that, but it, it really is a staggering thing. Like, obviously, no one is doing that. Yeah, the nuclear it's industry globally is in decline. I mean, more reactors are being shut down than are being built. There are new ones being built, but it's, you know, right. it's, it's not so going anywhere. Right, right, right. So where is it? So, so let's like, yeah, let, if Jason doesn't mind, let's do the conversation a little bit back, maybe towards, I don't know, what do you want to call them, psychological barriers or something to reckoning. Um, I had an, an example I wanted, you were talking about, uh, okay, well, yeah, we could technically use hydrogen as a fuel and we yeah. could do a conversion reaction with carbon from the atmosphere. We could make a synthetic fuel and all this kind of stuff. Hey, let's riff a bit on probably arguably one of the most important physical chemistry reactions of all time, the Haber-Bosch process mm -hmm. and the central role that that plays in the nitrogen cycle of the planet now. And where, where, you know, our whole food system is dependent on many things, including nitrogen fertilizer made by a process that consumes enormous quantities of fossil fuel energy, particularly natural gas right. to, 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 to generate that. And so we're, 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 we're in a situation where the most basic operations of our food system where we have to eat every day to be healthy. And, you know, it's, th there are manifold ways that this system is unsustainable, right? And as far as I know, there's no techno fix for this kind of thing. We have to have a different approach to agriculture, just in the same way that we have to have a different approach and a different mentality to transportation and that sort of thing. So, you know, and it, it seems pretty straightforward to me, the kind of things that we need to do. And Jason and I are working a lot on bolstering local agricultural initiatives mm -hmm. in our area. You know, it's kind of straightforward stuff. So the question is like, what is stopping us from reckoning with this real, a, a real hard nosed common sense approach to say, okay, this, you know, uh, energy future fantasy is just a fantasy. That's not gonna materialize. We're gonna have to go to a different plan. So what, what successful ways have you found to get conversations moving in that direction? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, food is a really good area. I'm glad you brought it up because it, uh, it's, it's something, it's an area where people actually do get to participate if they want in the whole process, you know, home, backyard gardening and so on. It's, it's close to people's hearts and, uh, and, and stomachs, of course. Um, so, you know, thinking about the absurdity of uh, 
nitrogen fertilizers, that's that's a, a fairly easy talking point. You know, once you tease out uh, the the unsustainability of it in so many different ways, as you were just saying, people kind of get that, and that's why organic farming and gardening has been growing and growing in recent years because it's such an easy argument to make. And I think carbon farming is another uh, easy argument. Look, say, you know, building lots of machines to suck carbon out of the air is crazy because all those machines are going to require all those materials to make them, all that energy to operate. And, and where do they put the carbon? And there's no market for the carbon. It's just it's, it's absurd on the face of it. Whereas if we think about putting carbon back into the soil, I mean, what has industrial farming done? It's caused carbon to go from the soil into the atmosphere, where, from where we want it to where we don't want it. So can we reverse that process? Well, it turns out we can. You can there are ways of doing agriculture that actually build soil rather than destroying it. And there's a whole movement now around carbon farming. And people love to talk about that because it's a solution. It, it, it's a solution to several problems at once. You know, it's, it's a climate solution. It's an energy solution. It's, um, it's a pro it, it, it solves a lot of problems with human nutrition and health. So, and, and doing it at a community scale, it, it's the, you know, economics and, and uh, localism, all of these things are, are really appeal to folks. So this is this is a good area to focus on. Yeah, do you, to broaden this out a, a bit, I'm just uh, thinking back to to the report, "The Futures Rule" by by Jason Bradford, where he, where he draws upon your 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 book. Um, do you see kind of uh, one kind of a reversal of we've seen this trend of increasing urbanization? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, being able to power the metabolism of the you know of the of the large cities, seeing kind of a reversal of that, more kind of distributed populations. Um, and and two, do you see agriculture as becoming much more localized? I guess I guess you've already, you've kind of already answered the second question, but in relationship to urbanization, how do you see if we're looking at kind of like just geographic distribution of, of people and and how we have to organize? Uh, our lives, you know, around energy uh, generation, uh, around food, you know, these are these are pretty pretty basic, you know, around yeah. water capture, uh, et cetera. Do you do you kind of agree with that with with his kind of um, hypothesis there? Oh yeah, I definitely do. Uh, mm -hmm. But the trend has not shifted yet yeah. on the large scale. I mean, if you look at the overall numbers, uh, they're still in the direction of urbanization. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are starting to wonder about, you know, where they're living now. Mm -hmm. And does that make sense in a long-term perspective? Does it make sense from a climate perspective and so on? So a lot of people are thinking, well, would I be better off, you know, living in a small town in Manitoba or Minnesota or someplace like that, mm -hmm. rather than in, you know, downtown or uh, in a suburb of Dallas or Houston or Los Angeles or Phoenix or any of these cities that are going to be unlivable in just a few decades, if not just a few years. So I, you know, I don't think these people are thinking, well, I want to, I want to move to a mega city somewhere in the north. First of all, there aren't that many mega cities. You know, maybe Toronto, but everybody's not thinking about moving to to Toronto. They're thinking about moving to smaller towns. And I think, I think as that trend uh, really gets underway over the next few years, then, then we will see a reversal of the, of the big trend that, that we've been seeing over the last few decades, which is yeah. uh, a trend toward urbanization. There is, of course, uh, the argument that a lot of, let's just call it, say, environmentalists make that if you have high urban density, uh, there's there's a lower carbon footprint. You can have more efficiency. Um, you know there, there's the, the argument about you know rural areas that I guess I'll, I'll call them kind of modern industrial rural areas where very car dependent. Um, you know it's you know they'll make the argument that that's not that's not very viable. Um, the counter argument that I would make is that uh, that's kind of true, but that's not accounting for the you know what actually rural areas would need to become, which is be, would be more kind of 
quasi self-sufficient kind of clusters again, where you do have some density, but at a smaller scale, like maybe a dense small town surrounded by agricultural fields or something. Um, right. do, do you want to respond to, you're probably very familiar with that, with that argument of like yeah, yeah. organization arg argument. Right, the argument assumes that uh, rural areas are going to operate in the future the way they do today at the level of amenity of you know, modern American towns and cities. If you look at um, uh, life in what, what we used to call the third world, but you know, less industrialized countries, places where people live closer to the land, then that, that rule just isn't the case. It's the cities that, that, uh, that use more energy per capita rather than the countryside. So that, you know, that, that dilemma is really all a product of you know, recent industrial development. Yeah. All right, well, um, maybe we can, uh, let's, maybe we can go back. I said, uh, we'll get into kind of political economy, kind of cultural implications. Uh, do you have, if you're putting on your kind of realist lens, um, do, do you have a sense of, is, is humanity gonna be, are we gonna be kind of picked up by the scruff of our neck and kind of thrown into the future through, through a lot of catastrophe and hopefully we'll figure it out at least, you know, um, you know as many people as possible or, or do you have, are you, are you hopeful that there will be some kind of paradigm shift before kind of the worst, you know, catastrophizing that we can think of happens. Um, yeah, I'm always hopeful that there will be a paradigm shift. Uh, so far, I've been discouraged again and again and again. <laughs> I don't see that much evidence of it. But I think we, you know, we will learn from disasters as they occur. I think we're in store for a lot of them. I think we're set up for them at this point, and it's it's too late to avoid altogether a 21st century that's just littered with 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 human and natural disasters. And I it gives me no pleasure to say that, yeah. because from a humanitarian standpoint and also an ecological standpoint, it's it's not going to be uh, a pretty situation. That said. Uh, you know, we can make the best of it or we can make the worst of it. Making the worst of it would be just fighting over what's left and, and, uh, and stripping nature clean of every living thing so that the, you know, the survivors can survive just a little bit longer. Right. Uh, we don't have to go there. We could make the best of a, a bad situation and, and learn from these disasters as they happen, uh, find ways to uh, to re-ruralize in uh, energy efficient ways. We could find ways to reduce conflict rather than uh, promoting it, which is what is happening now in all too many cases. We could, uh, we could discourage totalitarian takeover of, of our countries and, and cling to democratic norms that enable us to have more freedoms and more participation in the political process and in the, in the making of the decisions that will determine how we adapt to this new reality. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take work. You know, it's not going to happen automatically. Um, I think a, a book like uh, Paradise Built in Hell that, that looked at how, um, you know, people react, respond to natural disasters gives us in some ways a false hope because it's true that in the face of natural disasters, people pull together and work together and sacrifice and so on. It's also true that, you know, in, in the months and years after natural disasters, they often result in more inequality, more, you know, people taking the, the, the opportunity to enhance their own social and, and political power and so on. So none of this is automatic. Yeah. You know, um, there, there's a, a great book called the, uh, the Great Leveler by Walter Scheidel, a historian. And he's, he looks at inequality, economic inequality through history. And it's in his view, and this has been contested by some other historians, and that's a long story. But in his view, it's only in instance, uh, instances of revolution or natural disaster or 
financial collapse, that economic inequality has actually declined significantly. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at economic uh, and ecological disaster happening through the remainder of this century, well, that one of the of the bright spots is that this could result in more economic leveling, which would give more people opportunity to participate in the process of figuring all of this out. So if if you're looking for a bright spot, maybe that's it. It's a it's kind of a dark bright spot, but I guess that goes to the title of your pro podcast. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if I could uh, jump in with a question, Richard, um, <clears throat> I'd like to. I'd like to get your thoughts on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And specifically the way I want to frame the question is, and, and I'm not an expert at these things by any stretch yeah. of the imagination. Um, my impression from studying ecological economics and biophysical economics is that one way to think about our calamity is that the economic system has sort of become decoupled and detached from a lot of biophysical reality. It's right. become too abstracted a way from natural laws and processes and limits. And that's allowed the economy to just kind of go off into space and be too disconnected with the on the ground reality. Yeah. And I, you know, I know a lot of people who are like Bitcoin enthusiasts and stuff. And the question that I have, and I don't have an answer to it, maybe you do, is are there ways that a technology like cryptocurrency or Bitcoin could um, work to reinstate our connection with our biophysical basis on the planet? Is it just another instance of technology becoming another layer of abstraction and another way of being disconnected from the natural world? Or are there ways that it could actually ground us in, in, in limits of natural laws and, and uh, reintroduce some of that kind of health into the economy? If there's a way for it to do the latter, I haven't heard it yet. Uh, I'm no expert on, on cryptocurrencies either, but everything that I've seen so far suggests to me that it's a, it's a bubble and, and it's a pernicious bubble because producing these, especially Bitcoin, making mining Bitcoins takes so much energy. And for, you know, <laughs> for what? It's not, it's not durable in any way. It's not, <clears throat> it's not useful in any way other than simply as a symbol and, and store of wealth. Um, I would be more, much more in favor of if we're going to change our currencies, why, why shouldn't we have a, a, an energy backed currency so that, as you say, our, our currency is, is tied to some biophysical reality and energy is the most basic biophysical reality of all. So I would be in favor of that. The other thing I'd be in favor of um, is rationing. Um, and it, maybe that doesn't have to do with currencies, but we're talking about stuff becoming more scarce and we're talking about reducing the, the, uh, the, the human tendency to fight over what's left. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're gonna do that in a systematic way, what it looks like is rationing. You know, energy, food, all the other things that are, that are really necessary to getting through this, these difficult times, we've got, to, we've got to distribute them in ways that are fair and parsimonious that help people get used to the reality that we're gonna to have to use less and do it cooperatively. Yeah. That's what rationing is designed for. So I'm, I'm a huge, as time goes on, I get more and more in favor of rationing all the time. And I wish politicians would start talking about it. They, they're beginning to in Europe as a result of the natural gas crisis that Europe is quickly descending into and in this winter is going to be ugly for Europe they're going to have already natural gas is selling for like you know sixty dollars per uh, uh, million BTUs and usually in Europe it's seven dollars which is already more than it usually sells for in the U.S. which is more like three dollars but sixty dollars and and things haven't gotten really tough yet as they're going to this this winter so Europe has energy rationing in its future for sure. What my recommendation is, use that as an opportunity, get people used to it and find ways to, to introduce rationing in, in more ways that are, that are useful that acceptable and acceptable and that get people thinking the right way. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you 
uh, envision that maybe working in a place like the U.S.? Because I feel like rationing is like that. Wow, that's a real third rail kind of thing. Yeah. If you want to be a really unpopular politician in an instant, <laughs> talk about rationing, right? And so, yeah. and so, but, 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 I, I, okay, if you consider it from the level of a household, a family, a family has a limited budget, a limited resources. They have to share things. They have to do what makes sense. And it's not, it, you know, it's not some kind of crazy concept. But then you go to like the level of the federal government and you think about like U.S. federal government. OK, they're going to come out and say, all right, everybody, time to tighten your belts. We're going to ration energy and food and stuff. And I think it instantly the whole country erupts into c- complete chaos yeah. because we don't have this. We don't have the bonds of conviviality at the scale of a country of 330 million people mm-hmm. to do something like that. But it totally is imaginable at the scale of a household, a neighborhood, maybe a smaller, smaller unit. So could you, could you talk a little bit about how this sort of um, budgeting of consumption could be approached in a way that's not going to immediately not too scary. Turn, turn everybody into, you know, <laughs> killing each other? Yeah, well, you know, we already have rationing in some ways, like the food stamp program is, is a rationing program, actually. Um, everybody isn't on it, just poor people, right? So that's, that's the key in, you know, when stuff starts to become scarce, then the government can say, hey, wait a minute, we have to make sure that everybody has access to what they really need, and we have to do this fairly. And at that point, rationing starts to look really good to a lot of people. Until you get to that point, as you say, everybody's just, just going to say, hey, well, if I have the money, I should be able to consume as much as I want of whatever that good is. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's not going to work much longer. You know, that was the Wild West mentality of the United States that, to which so many people cling. And a lot of people think that's, that's the characteristic of when America was great and we need to keep making America great all the time. Well, the, it wasn't so great. And we can't go back. We're, we're headed into a, a different world this century, whether we like it or not. Let me try and get at Josh's question slightly differently. I think one, one thing that I um, picked up in your question, Josh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, we, I guess a lot of people wonder whether one, you know, uh, a rationing program wouldn't be subject to corruption, whether our political yeah. process oh, is yeah. capable of administering that fairly. Um, whether we want kind of technocratic kind of uh, oversight over how we live our lives. Um, And one thing we talk a lot about on this podcast is kind of going back to this notion of localism or or let's say bioregionalism of of, of thinking, let's say, so I live in West North Carolina. I I, I roughly think of like Southern Appalachia is is my bioregion you know, roughly, it could be defined other ways. Um, and, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about my relationships with my neighbors or in my county, or in say, you know, a compact of counties, at least I would feel like if, if you know, the governing bodies wanted to have a very frank conversation about resource limits, um, and, you know, it was a democratic process, not just you know, in a more participatory democratic process that, you know, wasn't just some corrupt representative making decisions and maybe handing off power to an emergency manager who's who's unelected. If it was a more kind of localized discussion about how can we produce for ourselves within the limits of the earth, you know, maybe that means that many more of us needs to grow food, right? It's like, let's, you have this lawn here, like, like, let's, Let's turn that into a garden. If you don't want to do it, maybe make it open to a community garden. Um, I think a lot, you know, a lot of people might be more comfortable with with this if it's more localized and more accountable, and and they feel like they have more agency in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Th- there's a whole book about this, by the way, um, called "Any Way You Slice It," okay, and uh, a book on, on on rationing and and why it sometimes works and why it sometimes doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, Paul, um, I'm, I'm really sorry that I'm blanking on his name because he's a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Ehrlich? No, 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 Paul. Uh, oh, please cut out the part where I'm blanking on his name. Uh, 
uh, he also wrote, I'm going to have to do a little editing here. We usually like to keep this kind of stuff in because it, it's kind of like charming for the audience, I think. Okay, and, and we're also really lazy. Okay. I mean, just so you know, me and Jason never forget anything or blank on names of authors. So. <laughs> yeah. This isn't, this isn't the book I'm talking about. Stan Cox. Mm -hmm. It's not Paul, it's Stan Cox. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me, Stan, if you're listening to this, because he's a, he's a terrific writer and researcher and I love his stuff. But um, anyway, in um, any way you slice it, he talks about how tr transparency is really, really important for these systems to work. So if, the, if there's suspicion that the people at the top are you know, skimming off for themselves, then the whole thing just falls apart. It, yeah. it, it does not work. But if you, if you have a really transparent system and people have a, a sense that they, they have a, a, a they benefit from it first of all, and also they're, they're, they have some way of, of controlling it or monitoring it, then, then they're, it tends to be much more successful. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Um, do you have other questions, Josh? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of still really interested in this thread because uh, it is something I think a lot about and I think I've become real skeptical about the ability of the technocracy to really address a lot of the kind of stuff that we're talking about. I don't have, I don't feel like a super optimistic and I, it's for some of the reasons that you mentioned, Richard, like that issue of transparency being really important and that the people at the top are not making one set of rules for everybody else and another set for them. And I feel like we saw a lot of that kind of thing, for example, you know, during COVID where political leaders would say, do this and don't do this. And then they would get caught doing that thing. They said, not right. you know, and we just see that a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I think that I think that one of the reasons that some of us have gravitated towards localism and bioregionalism is because perhaps like at that scale, we can begin to rebuild the bonds that are needed between people to work on these kind of things and to have transparency and accountability um, and any kind of top down. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely ambivalent enough to minds about this. There's so many cool models. Like we're, we're talking earlier, Jason and I were talking about Kate Raworth's donut economics, right? Yeah. Makes amazing sense, right? A minimum level of consumption of resources so that people have a decent life, a maximum level that you shouldn't exceed because then you start to draw down the, the natural capital or the biocapacity of the planet. And it's a great idea. And from, you know, the, the part of me that the scientist engineer like loves it. You just kind of calculate mm -hmm. everything and figure out how to get in the donut and boom, you get in the donut. But this idea that like <laughs> some um, cadre of super smart, you know, eco uh, progressive geniuses are going to lead global civilization through this transitional process of maneuvering us into the donut. Right. And it's like, well, that sounds about like the most unrealistic thing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> the reality you know, somebody's going to try to do something and then there's going to be a rebellion against that. And then, it, you know, it's 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 going to turn into people at each other's throats, <sighs> and stuff, which, I, you know, sucks. But yep. so I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, you know, realistically, can, maybe you can just give us your just most stone cold, sober uh, thumbnail sketch of the next 10 years in the U.S. specifically, and how how we are or are not going to respond to the intensification of these challenges. Yeah. Can I add well, something to this question as well? Sure, sure. How, so, so, how, so, the, so Josh's question was how you think we might or might not respond in the next 10 years. What I, I want to add, you know, how can each of us say, thinking about these things, how can we respond, right? As an individual, family, community, you know, county, maybe, you know, uh, scale to, to start preparing ourselves and our neighbors and our friends and our communities um, to, to have a softer landing. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the next 10 years don't look very good for the United States, I have to say. And a lot of it is down to uh, political division. And uh, it, it may take us most of that 10 years to overcome. It's, it's, countries have overcome political divisiveness before, and the United States has done it before. 
Uh, so it's not like it's not going to happen or it can't happen. I think it will happen, but it's not going to be an easy process and it is going to take some time before we can see each other as, as neighbors and fellow citizens again, instead of, you know, just, you know, two opposing worldviews that view each other as, as evil. <laughs> So we, we got to get beyond that. And that's, that's, a, that's a big priority because if, if, until we do get beyond it, then how do we accomplish anything else as a, as a collective society? It's very, very difficult. Um, so uh, as you were saying, you know, working in, in local communities has a lot of advantages. Um, and I think in this particular area, it has a lot of advantages because you can talk to people face to face instead of just talking to caricature, instead of, you know, tweeting to caricatures of who you think other people are. Um, so engaging at the local level, I think is really important for, uh, for folks who take all this stuff seriously. Uh, I, that doesn't mean giving up entirely on, you know, national politics and national issues like climate change. Um, I think it's important to pay attention and to do what you can in those discussions. Mm. And having said that, I think what we do at the local level is probably more impactful over the long run. And we can start to see these ideas. Some of these ideas like donut economics and, and uh, energy rationing may seem like things that, that only have relevance at the global or national level, but you know, they, they can help the conversation at the local level too. They can help us devise, you know, strategies and pathways and, and targets and goals mm -hmm. that, uh, that are in line with those, you know, those bigger, uh, big picture ways of, of seeing things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in his report, uh, Jason Bradford, he has a great section about the food system, about like what you can start doing in your local kind of food system with regards to, I mean, there's just so many practical things you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from, you know, you can do, if you're kind of a, a numbers person, you can, you can calculate things like, you know, how much arable land do you have, right? What is the productivity potential? What is the ownership structure of that land? Uh, if you're a people person, you can start connecting various organizations devoted to local food systems and, and see where the bottlenecks are and, um, see, you know, you know, you can be influential in, in, you know, creating different links in the food system, right? Connecting restaurants to, to farmers. Like there's just so many things that you can do. You can think, you, you know, you can be, become the compost person who, <laughs> you know, uh, helps distribute compost to different people who need them. Like there's just so many things once you start thinking in these terms and thinking about, okay, this is the world that we need to prepare for. And these are, you know, within these resource constraints, um, I, there is just so much that we can do. Um, and I think, yeah, I think for, for Josh and I, I mean, especially for me, like food systems is my focus. Like there's just so like, it's, it's actually quite inspiring. It's like, okay, there is a lot of work to do and I can, I can be very useful within my sphere of influence, which, you know, is like a county level or maybe like multi-county level. Yeah. yeah. Here, here. So I was wanting to ask, um, over the next few months, what do you have coming up? Do you have something really big coming up that you're excited about or that a new project that you're working on or a new initiative or something like that you want to tell us about? Uh, well, right now, the thing I'm uh, working on is a podcast oh, great. <laughs> based on my recent book, Power, Yeah, which is, uh, it's kind of a, a power is, I, I see it as kind of a textbook for understanding, understanding the human condition in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And sort of how we got here, and what what the you know how it all makes sense. Uh, so yeah, we, I want to give you a, if you want to talk more about this book. I have I have I have um, looked through some sections of power and uh, found it really interesting. But I've, I haven't read the whole thing. But if you, if you want to just talk a little bit more about it gives a, it gives a nice historical perspective on energy. If you want to. Yeah. Yeah, it looks that. it looks at power in in nature and human society. It looks at physical power, mm -hmm. and it looks at social power. How how these have developed, and and the overall thesis of the book is that power is good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, physical power the, is the ability to do something using energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what evolution is all about. It's what nature is all about. It's what and we human beings have gotten very good at extracting energy sources from the environment, starting with fire and wood, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of years ago, all the way up through fossil fuels and, and the present. And we've also gotten really good at social power, which is how to get other people to do things. And using writing to persuade people, using money to a little, a little more coercive, mm -hmm. all the way to weapons, which are really coercive. Mm -hmm. But you know, we've gotten really good at, at social power too. The thesis of the book is that while power is a good thing, it's possible to have too much of a good thing. And that's where we are as human beings. Now we've developed uh, weapons, scales of energy usage, population, all the rest that are unsupportable over the long run. So the question is, is it possible to self-limit? Has any species ever done that? Has any society ever done it? And there's a whole chapter devoted to that sh showing how, yes, in fact, self-limitation is inherent in nature and it happens all the time. I mean, even in our own physical bodies, there's homeostasis, which keeps us the self-balancing feedback processes. They're everywhere in nature. Without them, nature couldn't work. Our, our bodies couldn't work. So human society has, has uh, self-regulation processes. Democratic societies have checks and balances and so on to keep tyrants from arising and, and gaining too much social power. So we, we've left a lot of that self-regulation behind over the last few decades because we had so much cheap energy, we thought we could do anything. Mm -hmm. We developed this Star Trek mentality where literally the skies beyond the sky is the limit. There are no limits. And you see you know, advertising slogans everywhere. There are no limits, it's limitless. Mm -hmm. there, nothing is limitless in, in this world. And, and our, 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 the tragedy of the, of the last few decades is the development of this mindset that there are no limits and that, that we don't have to self-regulate. But in the 21st century, we're, we're pressing up against those limits. That's what the book Limits to Growth was about back in 1972. Yeah. And that's, it's coming to pass in real time. We're colliding with limits of how much the how much carbon the atmosphere can absorb, how much we can destroy soil in order to produce food, how many fish we can take out of it, you would name it. So what it's survival this century is gonna depend entirely and precisely on how we are able to limit ourselves as a species sufficiently and cooperatively enough to minimize the casualties that we're otherwise in store for. That's a, that's a pretty strong take home message. Um, Josh, do you have anything else that you want to, you want to say before we wrap up? Um, well, I, Richard, I just want to say that I have admired your work for so long. I appreciate it. I read resilience and post-carbon Institute. I have like, if not daily, weekly for 15 years, mm. um, I'm totally willing to nominate you to be a national treasure. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So kind of you to say, yeah. Josh. Thank yeah. And I, I mean, I think that, astute analysis and just really good even killed communication you know um i i definitely appreciate your work um i'll look forward to the podcast coming out about power and uh and and following that um i guess maybe you know to end what do you like to do for fun how do you uh, refresh yourself after all of these you know dealing with all of these tough thorny topics all day uh for me it's music um i've, I've been a musician my whole life uh, basically. And I, I was a violinist. I uh, played professionally and semi-professionally for many years. But uh, due to a physical injury, I'm no longer able to play the violin. So I'm learning to play the piano now. And uh, that's that really absorbs my attention on a daily basis. There's so much wonderful music to play, not just classical music, but ragtime and, and jazz and blues. And all, I'm trying to dip into all of those uh, streams and be nourished by them. So I'm, I'm totally excited by that right now. 
Nice. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Richard. This is a great honor to have you on. And um, yeah, this, I think this will probably come out. It'll probably take a few weeks to, to come out, but we'll let you know when it does. And cool. I also look forward to your podcast. I want to reiterate also what Josh says about really uh, admiring your work and, and um, it's really kind of helped help shape. Um, yeah, I think what, what both of us are doing today uh, and, and what we're trying to do with the Doom Rock Mism podcast. So thank you very much, Richard. And I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope you can play, play some music today. <laughs> I, I certainly right. will. Yeah. Well, uh, Jason and Josh, it's been a pleasure talking with you both and I wish you all the best. All right. Good luck to all of us as we Indeed. move forward in the century. Right. Yeah.